Welcome to the RSP Cast Film and Theory. I'm Matt Waldman. Always joining me every week is Adam Harstead with FootballGuys.com. You can find both of us at that, you know, venerable website for fantasy football. Um, certainly recommend getting a subscription there if you have the opportunity, if you've never checked it out. Um, though I have a feeling that most of you already have who, who listen to this show. Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about Arthur Smith and B. John Robinson and maybe why folks like J.J. Zacharyson are saying that he uh, he's sitting down and maybe why that's not such a bad thing. Um, and then, you know, we'll get into a little bit more refined conversation um, about <laughs> the regression of quarterbacks and maybe why it's not as great of a regression as other positions. Um, and then a, a focus on some excellent work that Adam did in conjunction with, you know, you know kind of, piggybacking off of Dan Hendry's fine work on valuating um, dynasty picks and trades. And and then maybe we'll finish up with some thoughts on who we're buying, selling, and holding in dynasty based off of a work that I did in, in this recent gut check. So Adam, starting off, Arthur Smith, you know, was that, I probably asked in the press conference. Uh, honestly, I didn't do it in an in, in-depth listen to it. I just was kind of laughing that J.J. Zacharyson was um, basically responding that, you know, that Arthur Smith probably pee sitting down. Um, so the fact that, you know, our lo- one of the local Pittsburgh people was questioning Arthur Smith's manhood um, in a really in a mocking sort of light. I think he meant it in a light sort of way. Um you know, got my attention. And then I listened to, to some of what Arthur Smith had to say. And honestly, I felt like one of the peanuts in the, in the, in the classroom scene where I'm just hearing blah, 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 because really all it came across to me was, um, you don't really, you know, I don't really want to tell you why I used or didn't use Bijan Robinson as much or why I make decisions that I do with my running backs. We have three good running backs. We'll go with a hot hand. You know, if somebody gets hot, we're going to use them in that fashion. Um, and the decisions that I make regarding that, you don't really understand because you're not behind the curtain here. Um, so when I hear that, Adam, I just think, look, th- there's there's probably some logic that we can just, we can probably surmise from this without having to listen to what his actual statement was because he's just like most coaches they they're just telling the media whatever it's just they have to be there as Marshawn Lynch said you know I have to be here so I don't get fined I think that that's basically how coaches and players feel most of the time when they're asked about football in the way that they're being asked because a lot of the questions are quite pointed I just saw like a Lamar Jackson interview where the reporter asked you know can you talk about why you think you guys aren't um able to follow up one win with another one or and then Lamar points out goes well what you didn't say is that we actually won two in a row in this particular instance and followed up from being behind there and and he said it in a very adept sort of way to 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 look at the reporter and going you're pointing this question in one direction when actually it's not actually um a may not be as legitimate of a question so i'm not going to legitimize your answer and there's a lot of that game plan going on between reporters and 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 folks so you know back to it with robinson what are your thoughts on arthur smith's use of him um do you think there's logic to what he's doing regardless you know does it change how you value robinson um long term with smith at the helm um and you know just any thoughts with you know coaches and and media in terms of these types of exchanges yeah i mean i think smith is seems kind of like a jerk Uh, you know like he's just being (laughs) he's pugnacious he's just picking fights for the sake of picking fights and he's taking shots at you know like the reporter has a legitimate interest in the answer to the question like hey why was Bijan robinson not on the field like football exists because of the fans. The fans want to know. That's a legitimate question, legitimate purpose. And I get, you know, Arthur Smith has different goals than the reporter. The, the reporter's trying to figure out what's going on. Arthur Smith is trying to win football games. A lot of times telling the reporter what's going on is contrary to that goal. That's fine. That's fair enough. I'm not saying Arthur Smith needs to like 
you know, share his playbook and spell out his weekly game plan in the press conference. But like you can, it, there's a long history of giving like inoffensive non-answers and Smith could just do that. Oh, I'm, I'm looking ahead to Cincinnati. I'm on to the next week or, you know, like, Oh, um, whatever. But he, he always feels the need to throw in like all of these shots to like armchair quarterbacks and, and fans and, Oh, heaven forbid fantasy football players weren't happy with it. Like, who do you think your, your customer base is here, dude? Yeah. It's the fantasy football players. Like nobody's watching the Atlanta Falcons right now, except for, diehard fans and fantasy football players. So I kind of feel like it's on, and, and I'm not going to manage his personality. He can be whoever he is. I probably wouldn't really want to hang out with him in real life. I, in reality, he's probably much more pleasant in real life. And he, he views these press conferences as like a contrived part of his job. And that's not like a reflection of who he really is, but it, I don't know. I feel like it, it bugs me that it, it doesn't bug me that he's not giving answers or, or the answers that he gives are blatant lies. Like he said that he gave Bijan less workload because he was going with the hot hand when Tyler Algier was averaging 2.8 yards per carry. Like that hand could not have been any colder. And that's fine. You're not obligated to play anybody at any point. You know, his offense has been doing pretty well, especially considering the limitations at quarterback. So like what he's doing has been working. It, it It's not maybe what fantasy football fans would like him to be doing, but it's working. It's fine. Keep doing it. You, you don't need to, first of all, insult people who care about you and your team and your players. You don't need to do that. And you don't need to insult their intelligence either. Just make up some boilerplate answer. Football coaches solved press conferences like 80 years ago. That's why we hear the same five stock phrases. Just stick to the script, dude. Stick to the script and this goes away. And, and ironically, like he hates press conferences and he wants this to go away. But the way he's dealing with it, make sure it's never going to go away. This he is just why keeps Bill Belichick, poking the bear. Right. It's why Belichick gives the most boring answers possible because he doesn't want to deal with it. And he knows that's how you make it go away. Yeah. So... Yeah. Fair, fair play to Arthur Smith, however he wants to manage his team. I've been relatively impressed overall with the Falcons relative to the limitations that they've had to work with. Um, you know, people joke that, like, he's giving Jonu Smith as much run as Kyle Pitts. It's working, yes. you know? Like, it's not like – it's not like – it's like people who get mad about – like the Eagles doing quarterback sneaks at the goal line instead of giving the ball to, to DeAndre Swift. Eagles scored a touchdown. That's all they care about. Jameer right? Gibbs, they don't care David about Montgomery it. early in the right. season, you know, right. all that. Yeah, I get why you would be frustrated as a fan or as a, as a fantasy player. I don't think the fans really mind. Um, but yeah, I think there's also a deeper question here. And I don't really know who shops to groceries, so to speak, in Atlanta. Um, but I do think there are questions like, are they using optimal resource allocation just in terms of who they're bringing into the team and what they're spending to acquire them? And, and that's a debate very much worth having. And, and I think there could be interesting points, but Arthur Smith is using his players in a way that is, that is working. Maybe 30 out of 32 coaches would not be doing anything remotely like that, but He's doing what he's doing and it's working fine. And I think he's at least bought himself a little bit of space um, from from the second guessing and armchair quarterbacking. Um, I don't really know why he held Bijan Robinson out last week. It certainly wasn't because Tyler Algier had the hot hand, but the claim was headaches he, that he had headaches and medicine sure. didn't work, you know. Which is fine. And that's yeah. great. That's great. You know, like prioritize the long term health of your cornerstone running back. Um, I'm not worried about him long term because Given how much Atlanta has invested in him, either Atlanta is going to use him or else Atlanta is going to suck and Smith is going to get fired and they'll bring in somebody who's going to use him. This is this is the sort of problem that sorts itself out in the long term. <laughs> right. You know, this is very short term problems. Um, it sucks if you get the zero in your lineup and you're really expecting something because he'd been rolling and th that sucks. I get I, I completely empathize with that. Um, although I would also say that, remember, for every fantasy manager who had Bijan in their lineup and got a zero, there was another fantasy manager who had Bijan in their opponent's lineup and got a gift. So on net, that wound up working out. Uh, yeah. I, you mentioned before the show about not wasting carries on a year that's probably not going anywhere and workload management. And um, 
I don't know. Workload management is kind of a completely different thing. And I don't really know how much that matters. Like, I'm not more optimistic about Bijan's future just because Atlanta's not going to run him into the ground. Um, mostly because I think that, like, the threshold for running a player into the ground is so far above what we see in today's NFL. Like, yeah. teams used to absolutely hit that back in 2004. But nowadays, virtually nobody's getting 300 carries. And I don't even think 300 is is a problem. I think it's more like 350 that starts to be the risk point. Um, so yeah, I'm not worried about his long-term health. I'm not worried about his long-term outlook. I'm not worried about what Arthur Smith is going to choose to do with his team. It's kind of interesting to watch. I like having the diversity. Um, I, but yeah, I think he is the source of his own problems and he should just get out of his way. If I were to offer unsolicited advice, which I'm sure Arthur Smith neither wants nor needs. Yeah, well, I'd say this. If you enjoy the whole Arthur Smith bashing, I would say the best one that I did see earlier this week was on TikTok. If you like TikTok, um, James Coe did a really great um, performance piece where he was Arthur Smith, basically two sides of Arthur Smith's brain. Um and how he was motivated by people calling him a Nepo baby. Um, and so I found it quite humorous and well done for a short, a produced short. A lot of these fantasy analysts these days, I think really are just like frustrated actors and directors who want to like, who, who want to be out there um, doing that stuff. And James did a really nice job of it, I have to say. Um, but, you know, on the serious tip with this, I, I, I'm with you about, you know, I think your, your explanation about Smith and that he's just creating his own mess with the media is absolutely the case. He probably he could probably just take like a three day course and uh, on how to deal with media probably from somebody like in the off season and it would just make him feel better. You know he would probably enjoy it. He, he would probably have a, a a more satisfying week dealing with them for the rest of his career. Um, in turn, he doesn't need much to to really how to handle that. But in terms of Bijan Robinson, I mean, I'm with you. I understand about the uh, the workload with carries, and and that and that makes sense. I just look at it though at this point of the season, or this point of the Falcons' development, it's clear they don't have a quarterback. If you ask me, I, I their quarter he's a he's going to be a nice backup who can maybe give you journeyman starts, just like what you had last year in Marcus Mariota. He's essentially that track. So they're either drafting a quarterback, or maybe they're maybe if the the Bears are just completely foolish and decide that they're going to ditch Justin Fields, maybe they'll get Justin Fields, and Justin Fields will be unbelievable in that offense as the player he is, even if he's not the full fledged, you know, version of the franchise quarterback that that the Bears expected when they you know got him out of the box. But Bijan, to me, it's like this: if if you know that your player is dealing with something and it's at this point in their career and it's early on and you've got Cordero Patterson who's good enough for one game to, to perform well, if at least even week to week, you could probably get three or four good weeks out of him before he gets beaten up a little bit just because you know of how physically he plays. And Algier has been okay at times this year. Even though his, you know, his current production doesn't look as great, I've, you know, there's ways that you can use him and Cordero Patterson effectively and generate, um, you know, production in your offense. And I think that's what he was doing. Um, and so I don't worry about it as much. For me, you know, Bijan Robinson was always a dynasty play. Like to me, he's a top five dynasty pick. Um, in terms of if you're building, you know, if you're trying to to build a, a, a team, if you're trying to win right now, you know, he's just below that tier um, for me. More in that in that top twelve to top fifteen, it, you know, if you're looking at, at, at a window of like three years being a career, you know, and you're thinking this is your your team in that window that window of time. So. Yeah, it's kind of a nothing burger for me, but it, I I thought it's worthwhile to discuss just because it's creating a lot of um, it's creating a lot of talk on you know on social media and probably with people around you know the country who are have interest in Bijan Robinson. I think you just have to understand he's a dynasty play. Arthur Smith's going to be Arthur Smith. 
and he's and you're right he's done a good job with this team overall because if they I believe if they had Justin Fields this team would probably be atop its division uh, and would and Fields would probably not be getting the flack that he's getting um, just because I think Smith has knows how to use quarterbacks who maybe have a limited conceptual game at this stage of their career um, but at the same time are willing to you know be act on certain criteria with a sense of immediacy that good quarterbacks do and I don't think that's I think that's the missing component with Desmond Ritter and then you just add on to the fact that Justin Fields on turf with his legs and what he can do and what Smith could design for him would be would just open up this run game in a level that it would be a, a lot of what we saw with the Ravens in some in some response you know even under Greg Roman but I would say somewhere between what Greg Roman did and what um, Todd Munkin has been doing right now, allowing you know Lamar Jackson to have an open, you know, a, a more open passing game, and that he's not a, as I've jo- I've I've kind of joked, he's not, you know, savioring um, Lamar Jackson into a cage in the way that uh, that Greg Roman did with his limited offense. So yeah, um, you know, moving forward, let's take a look at you know, let's talk a little bit about quarterbacks and since we're I've already kind of talked about brought up that subject of that position you know you wrote a, a cool article in regression alert about quarterback stats and how they don't regress as much but with one exception so I'm wondering if you could share folks a little you know a little taste of that and get and get, maybe give an example or two yeah so um I, I like to write that you know everything regresses but not everything regresses at the same rate there are some things that are more of a reflection of intrinsic underlying skill. And there are some things that are more of a reflection of external factors. I call it luck, but it's really just anything that the player doesn't have direct control over. Like for instance, if a running back breaks past the line of scrimmage, jukes the linebacker and has a clear path to the end zone, that's skill. If he is five yards away from the end zone, he's going to get five yards. If he's 95 yards away from the end zone, he's going to get 95 yards. So how far he gets past that, that's luck. That's not really in his control where the offense decided to hand him the ball. So yards per carry is the classic example I use where there's just a huge luck component where it's not just how good are you at breaking long runs? It's where is the offense when you break one of those long runs? Because if they're close, you're not getting a high yards per carry out of it, even if you're doing the exact same thing. You know, the same play in the red zone is not going to get you as many yards per carry as the same play backed up against your own goal line. Uh, So yards per carry is the classic example where there is some intrinsic skill involved in a running back getting that. Although I I often say that the skill involved is not the skill people think it is. Uh, Mostly the skill is straight line speed and it's the ability to, to take those plays where you've gotten past the initial wave of defenders and leg it out to a huge distance. That's what predominantly impacts yards per carry. So slower backs always have lower yards per carry, even if they're still very good and effective. Le'Veon Bell, even when he was at his peak, was like a 4.4, 4.5 yard per carry guy just because he was never breaking those 80 yarders to, to pad his stats. Um, but yards per carry is the quintessential, much more heavily influenced by external factors than factors intrinsic to the player. Uh, but quarterback, Uh, most quarterback production is much more skill loaded. And this kind of makes sense, you know, for a wide receiver to produce, um, he's much more dependent, I think, on his teammates and the opposing defense um, because like the wide receiver not only has to beat the defender in front of him and get open, but the quarterback has to see him. The quarterback has to be able to deliver an accurate ball. The other wide receivers on the field have to not get more open before the quarterback looks in his direction. Um, there's just a lot that has to go right for a receiver to earn a target and get the yards. Uh, whereas the quarterback, um, yeah, sure, he needs the offensive line to protect him, although the quarterback can move in the pocket and can bail out of the pocket, and there's things he can do to mitigate protection issues. And yeah, the quarterback needs a, a receiver to get open, but on any given play, there's five different receivers, so he can go from one receiver to another, and there's things he can do to mitigate separation issues from his receiving core. Um, and and um, a good offensive coordinator can help and can scheme up plays, but but 
the quarterback controls more of his production than, than most of his peers on offense do control theirs. Um, and as a result, um, Danny Tucido, he's a fellow football guy, he has run, it's called split half correlations, where basically like you take a player um, who has like a thousand career plays and you pick 50 plays at random in one sample and you pick 50 plays at random in another sample and you repeat that, you know, a hundred times and then you see how well the first sample correlates to the second sample. So for something that's very stable, like if a quarter, if a running back runs for exactly four yards on every play, then the first sample will average four yards per carry and the second sample will average four yards per carry and there'll be a perfect correlation. So that stat will stabilize or it will, it will reach a point where the correlation is higher than 50% very, very quickly. Um, for something that's very, very unstable, it's gonna, you're gonna need a huge sample um, before you get a correlation that's higher than 50% or, or an R-squared that's higher than 50%. And Danny calculated that for yards per carry for a running back, you need um, 1,978 carries for that to stabilize. For like the, the yards per carry in one sample to correlate with yards per carry in another sample at a high level, which if you're averaging 250 carries a year, that's eight years. Eight years for a running back's yards per carry to stabilize. Because their just, career is over. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I mean, there are, like, like yeah. Jamal Charles had an amazing career, and, like, by the time he retired, he had, like, just reached the point where we could say that his yards per carry was more skill than luck. Um, <laughs> just, just to put it into context, it's just a massive... Danny wrote, in typical Danny fashion at the time, he, he called it a vomit-inducing 1,978 <laughs> carries. <laughs> Stuck with me. So we're talking um, about pee and vomit today. This is this is right. the sh this is the show. Here we are. Absolutely. All right. Uh, so yards per carry, very 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 um, loaded on factors outside of running backs control. Uh, yards per attempt for a quarterback using the same methodology. I think it takes 396 attempts before yards per attempt stabilizes. Which not only is that a substantially substantially smaller number of attempts, but quarterbacks get. 600 pass attempts a year compared to 250 rush attempts for running backs so like really like 10 12 games and you can be you can be confident that a quarterback's yards per attempt is more skill than luck which is extraordinarily fast for things like this and and it's always a sliding scale like this is just the tipping point where it becomes more than 50 50 but that means after eight games, we could say it's 40% skill, 60% luck. That means after two games, we could say it's even like 20% skill, 80% luck. Um, but the bigger the sample, the, the more confident we can be. And it doesn't take much sample to be confident in something like yards per attempt. Um, completion percentage stabilizes even faster, especially because that's not necessarily measuring skill, that's measuring preference. Um, you know, that's measuring like how a quarterback wants to play rather than like how successfully he plays. Um, so quarterback stats and, and like a lot of the stuff I look at, you look at the quarterback equivalent and it just stabilizes too fast for us to make much profit predicting regression. I, I really like looking at yard to touchdown ratios um, and for wide receivers and running backs, like typically a wide receiver or a running back will score a touchdown for every 120 to 180 yards. Um, that's Almost any running back or wide receiver you can think of in the NFL today, their career average is going to be between 120 and 180. Occasionally, you'll get like these extreme super scorers who are just exceptionally good at scoring touchdowns, like Rob Gronkowski, Randy Moss, Des Bryant, and they're at around 100 yards per touchdown. And then on the other end, you get these extreme like yardage heavy receivers like Julio Jones, Andre Johnson, Henry Ellard. They're at like 200, 220 yards per touchdown. Nobody's at 300 yards a touchdown. Nobody's at 80 yards a touchdown. So if you see somebody who's there in the short term, you know they're going to regress. And then the other crucial thing is like, I mean, just listen to the names I mentioned. There's good players at the very bottom of the distribution, and there's good players at the very top of the distribution. So when a guy is, is outside of the bands, like it doesn't matter if he's good or not. We know that like good players can really wind up anywhere. Um, but you look at yards to touchdowns for quarterback, um, and that's not the case. Like the best quarterbacks have fewer yards per touchdown. Guys like Patrick Mahomes, Russell Wilson, Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, they're all down at like 120 to 140 yards per touchdown. Whereas bad quarterbacks or even mediocre quarterbacks, Sam Bradford, um, 
Derek Carr, those kind of guys are going to be more like 160 to 180. So when I see a wide receiver who's averaging very low yards per touchdown, I can easily point to him and be like, look, that guy's going to regress. He's going to start scoring more touchdowns. But if I see a quarterback who has very high yards per touchdown, you can't just look at it and say, well, he's going to start scoring more touchdowns because eh, maybe he's just not that good of a quarterback. Like if Patrick Mahomes has very low yard to touchdown ratio compared to the rest of the NFL, it's not going to regress. He's Patrick Mahomes. He scores a lot of touchdowns. That's who he is. Um, so yeah, quarterback stats. I, I tried making some predictions on them over the years, and those usually tend to backfire on me just because quarterback play is so skill loaded. Uh, my most successful one is the only time in the column's history I predicted something wouldn't regress, where I said, like, here's the low outliers on yards per attempt. Here's the high outliers on yards per attempt. The low guys are going to stay low. The high guys are going to stay high. If this were yards per carry, I predict they all converge to the middle, but they're, it's quarterbacks. They're not going to do that. They're going to stay separated. Um, but then the one exception, the only quarterback stat, really, um, the, or the only relevant one, is interception rate which is just so dependent on, first of all, context, because quarterbacks who are trailing throw more interceptions. Um, rationally so, because you need to take bigger risks to get back in the game. Uh, second depends on the defenses you're facing. Obviously, some defenses are better. Uh, and there's a huge luck component where there's the joke that if defensive backs had good hands, they'd be wide receivers. You know, you can throw eight balls at defensive backs where they get their hands on it and they might walk away with seven of them. They might walk away with one of them. Neither result is really that surprising. Um, and that tends to regress very strongly because that's factors outside of quarterbacks control. So that's one of my favorites. My three go-tos every year, I predict yards per carry regression and I predict yard to touchdown ratio regression for non-quarterbacks. And then I predict interception rate regression. And those always regress like dramatically shockingly from one sample to the next uh which is fun because people think it's real people think that like oh this back just like he's he's a genuine high yard per carry running back and then he comes crashing back to earth and everybody's always surprised every time or they think oh brock purdy he's just great at avoiding interceptions no nah, brock purdy's gonna throw more picks going forward like it sorry if you're a 49ers fan but it's luck it's noise it's not really something you can rely on his high yards per attempt his high touchdown rate, that's all like meaningful signal. His low interception rate, that's just dumb luck. Yeah, that's a fascinating conversation or presentation of the information that you have. And I think, you know, obviously really worthwhile. One thing that I'd like to explore a little bit more is when you talk about like the skill luck part of it, because like when I look at quarterbacks, part of when I look at the yardage part that you're, that you're mentioning too, is that quarterbacks have more control over I mean I would look at it and say that the reason that the number of um, throws is their attempts is lower than say running backs is that with quarterbacks they tend to play in the same systems um, there's less variation and even though there's more um, there are more players they have to lean on um, in order to make things work um, there are more options for skillful manipulation of what's going on um, to them because they can either manipulate inside or outside the pocket. They can check down. They can go deep. They can do certain. There are certain things that are going to be available that are easy decisions to get out of a bad situation compared to say a running back. With a running back, if the guard fucks up his block early in the play and it's going towards that guard. Um, there's not as many options of recourse for, for a running back as there are for a quarterback when the guard blows his assignment on a passing play where the running back's running away from the line of scrimmage as opposed to running towards it. So there's some intrinsic things where you go, I can understand why a running back needs more touches in order for us to really see because the, there's smaller room for error with a running back than there actually is for a quarterback. And I would that's why I would argue when we talk about processing and GMs say that a quarterback and running back are both two players that really have to have high-end processing and we're just discovering that. It may be that quarterback has a far more diverse collection of skill sets 
that he has to employ and that processing has a broader band of knowledge it's a you know they have to have more of a wider brand you know bandwidth of knowledge to be able to employ to process in a variety of ways whereas with a running back with the exceptions of guys like Kamara and Falk or anybody that James Brooks people used on the outside in the slot a little more often um and in, a, and in multiple positions they theirs is more is narrower you know but at the same time that little micro world that a running back exists in the margin for error for them is very slim and the and so there's a you know so when someone like jay moyer or myself talk about micro movements with ezekiel elliott and we're talking about how skilled he is and in terms of making the smallest movements that make a difference in a two-yard loss and a one-yard gain now for a fantasy gm they could care less because he's only if he's averaging less than four yards per carry they're unhappy and then they're looking at the bright shiny toy and tony pollard and going get him on the field more get him on the field more well here's ezekiel here we are in new england new, ezekiel elliott has split time with a good back and Ramondre stevenson again with a line that isn't performing very well but he's still on the field and making positive plays that may not show up as well in the fantasy column but here we are in dallas and tony pollard you know he's producing well but you could argue that Ezekiel Elliott would be doing similar things in Dallas right now with what Tony Pollard's doing when it comes to his production. You know, Pollard is a bigger, uh, obviously a, um, a faster player, you know, but I, I, this is the, this was the argument that I've been kind of laughing and waiting for is to, is for us to look at Pollard and be, well, slightly disappointing, and I'm going, well, it should be a major disappointment for those of you who've been years arguing that they needed to get rid of Zeke because he's not good as opposed to his contract was higher than what it needed to be for a running back and we could go cheaper with Pollard. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I think your like your left guard blowing a block illustration I think is a great example of just how much more dependent running backs are on their teammates for their production. And, and factors outside their control that I yeah. think a quarterback can mitigate mistakes from the teammates a lot better than a running back can. A, a running, it's not that a running back can't do anything. It's yeah. just that if there's a blown block, there's only so much a running back can do, whereas a quarterback has much, much more open yeah. to them. Um, the skill levels, the skill levels may be this. There's still maybe skill level with that, but the way skill shows up in the results column doesn't have nearly as big of a factor for a quarterback that's how i would argue it but yeah yeah and and so like epa um estimated points added um is a really cool stat uh it was invented i think i've told this story before it was invented in 1970 by the bengals starting quarterback a guy named virgil carter who was actually like doing his his master's dissertation in statistics in at in night school at college while he was starting for the Cincinnati Bengals and he's like hey let's like use some of this uh let's use some of this football data to, to make this cool model um and it you know like it wound up taking over the the entire NFL and 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 most football analysis these days most analytics is going to be built with EPA as its base and EPA is was never designed to measure player performance it's it, it's meant to measure offensive performance as a guest all whole uh where like it's 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 inappropriate to say from a technical standpoint that patrick mahomes averages whatever epa per play the the, the proper completely proper um way to phrase it would be the kansas city offense averages this many epa per play on plays where Patrick Mahomes drops back and throws the football. And that's a result of Patrick Mahomes. That's a result of his offensive line. That's a result of his wide receivers. And it's a result of Andy Reid, the play caller, and defensive matchups. And it's a result of everything, all bundled into one. But it has been popular to take EPA off-label um, and apply it to players and to, to say Patrick Mahomes averages X EPA per play. Um, and one of the reasons it's popular is because it kind of works. A, a quarterback controls enough of the offense that an offense's passing EPA per play is probably a reasonably good reflection of how well that quarterback is playing. It's never perfect. And there was a big debate with Brock Purdy, um, who's like the outlierist of any of the outliers, just because of what Mike Shanahan is doing for him 
to make his job easier and and how his um degree of difficulty is just radically different than nearly anybody else's in the nfl except perhaps for to attack of Iowa. and that's not meant to diminish either of them because they're both executing what is demanded of them at an incredibly high level and that's reflected in the apa per play which is top of the charts um but um some people will get mad when I say, when I talk about a quarterback's EPA, and they'll say that EPA is not a quarterback stat. And they're absolutely right. It's not. It's not meant to be a quarterback stat. But I think it belongs about as much to a quarterback as something that, something like passing yards per attempt, because passing yards per attempt isn't strictly a quarterback stat either. That also depends on an offensive line's ability to sit, to sustain blocks. It also depends on receivers getting open. It's also crediting them for yards after the catch. And if I had to guess like what percentage of yards per attempt a quarterback was responsible, maybe it's 40%. You know, if, if you look at, like if a quarterback changed teams from one year to the next, I'd expect maybe about a 40% correlation between yards per attempt from one, from one team to the next. I think 40% of it belongs to the quarterback, 60% of it belongs to everything else. For EPA per play, it's probably a similar percentage. It's probably yeah. about 40%, I would guess. And I think, um, and I think yeah, that correlation is a good thing to talk about and that it's a lower correlation than what people might, you know, some people might have thought just because you know, Michael Lopez talked about it this year. He said, you know, that NFL expected points models are all subject to selection bias so that some offenses make the red zone more often. So any reference inference that like, say, a red zone tendency can overfit to to better teams really isn't, you know, quite there. And and it's one of those things that it, it just points out that what I know, some analytics people I know in the NFL who've worked in it say that they've been saying for years is that, selection bias can kill epa you know wp models and and why they need to be used with heavy modifiers you know yeah i always say on twitter um harstad's razor anytime you see anything cool interesting compelling uh just assume that it's selection bias until proven otherwise um and it's you know it's meant to be used like Occam's razor or Hanlon's razor, where like, hey, here's this really cool thing. It's probably selection bias. And and Lopez is absolutely right. EPA like league average EPA in the red zone is going to be a lot higher than league average EPA outside the red zone because it's it's disproportionately good teams. And I was kind of talking about that with interception rate this week in regression alert too, where like interception rates are lower when when quarterbacks are ahead but part of that is because quarterbacks who are ahead tend to look a lot more like Tom Brady and quarterbacks who are behind tend to look a lot more like Zach Wilson and Tom Brady's a better quarterback who throws fewer interceptions than Zach Wilson um, so you have to control for that you have to control for the selection bias and there's um, there's really interesting debate going on on analytics Twitter right now ESPN has a wide receiver model um, that's really really cool and kind of cutting edge and there's not really anything like it right now. And it's using player tracking data. And it's just based on the chips. They're saying like, how open is a wide receiver getting relative to expectations for that route against that coverage? Um, and it's it's based on like separation from the defender. But more than that, it's about like relative positioning. So if you're between the quarterback and the ball on a curl, like that's good. You're open even if the defender's right on top of you. If you're um, only a yard apart, but you are going twice as fast as that you're really open because you're about to accelerate through that or if the defender is going in the wrong direction um because you got them turned around at the stem got, then they're you're looking open. at leverage okay right it, it's it's awesome and it's cool and um one of the things that they're doing is they're comparing to average expectation by an average receiver in that situation but the reality is average receivers don't get put in all situations. And, and the big example that I'm seeing right now is slot receiver. Um, like how would an average receiver do in the slot? We don't know. We don't see average receivers in the slot. We see slot receivers in the slot. And the guys who, who spend a lot of time in the slot typically do that because they're pretty good. You know, like most full-time dedicated slot receivers, they get open a lot. That's why they're full-time dedicated slot receivers. Uh, and it, it's kind of a joke, but guys like Christian Kirk and Amon Ross St. Brown um, and, and uh, Cooper Cup, like they get open a lot. And so the model's expectation is if a guy's in the slot and running routes, he's probably going to get open. And so when 
uh, Christian Kirk and Amon Ross St. Brown and Cooper Cup and Chris Godwin do run that route and do get open, the model's like, oh, well, that's what I expected because he's a slot receiver. So his open score is average. And and that's a consistent problem. Like you look at um, Chris 25 Godwin. 25 years ago, they would have said, oh, he's in the slot. He's probably not going to be open. I mean, because right. that's because the game had changed, you know? Right. And, and there is outside receivers are more valuable than slot receivers because there's a lot more variance. Like the difference between a great outside receiver and a terrible out receiver is chasmic. It's, it's massive compared to like the difference between a great slot receiver and a terrible slot receiver. The difference is not as big. Slot production is more replaceable. It's like the running back debate where um, like, obviously the next guy's not going to be as good as Cooper cup, but the fall off from Cooper cup to the next guy is a lot smaller than the fall off from Justin Jefferson to the next guy. And as a result, if I were an NFL GM, I would offer a bigger contract to Justin Jefferson than Cooper Cup. Not necessarily because he's better, but because the things he he does on the football field, the things he excels at are rarer. So in in one extent, it's okay for the model to say that like slot receivers are not really getting as open, like top slot receivers are not really getting as open as top outside receivers. But if you look at like Chris Godwin, Chris Godwin played um, at least 66% of snaps outside in um, 2017 and 2018, his first two years. And he's playing at least 66% of snaps outside this year. And then in between, in the four years in between, he played at least 66% of snaps in the slot. And the model says Chris Godwin was, was pretty good, pretty solid, well above average at getting open his first two years. And then he was a below average separator for the next four years when he's primarily in the slot. And now that he's back outside, all of a sudden he's an amazing separator, one of the best in the league again. <laughs> and that's not what happened. It's not like yeah. Chris Godwin was really good his first two years and then like kind of below average the next four and like really good right now. It's that because of selection bias, the model is comparing uh, Chris Godwin to worse players when he plays outside than it is when he plays inside. And as a result, he's not outperforming as much inside as he was outside. Um, and so, yeah, it's just another example of how selection bias and, and, and ESPN to their credit is working hard trying to control for this, but these are, these are not simple problems with simple solutions, uh, which is why Harstad's razor is a thing that exists. You know, Tyree kill ranks a lot lower than you expect in ESPN's model, Harstad's razor, it's probably selection bias. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, that, that would probably be, I like that they're doing what they're working on behind the scenes, but maybe some of the guys who are, you know, some, some of the front people who are, um, content creators should probably realize that a little bit more before they start talking about, you know, maybe Tyree kill isn't that good of a wide receiver. Um, yeah, you know. it's, it's one thing to have a model that doesn't fit. Like outliers are never quite going to fit a model. Like yeah. I could say quarterbacks, when like when they get pressure, their sack rate tends to go up and their average depth of target tends to go down. And I put Patrick Mahomes against that model and he gets pressure and his sack rate does not really go up and his average depth of target does not really go down. <laughs> right. And you could say, somebody might say, well, your model's broken. I would say if my model is built to fit Patrick Mahomes, it's not going to fit anybody else. And yeah. that's okay. I don't need this model to be perfect. I, it, when you're doing stuff like this, it's important to have humility and to recognize that like all models are wrong. Some models are useful. This, this model's telling me stuff that I can use and can leverage, but I need to understand that just because my model says Tyreek Hill is the 16th best receiver in the NFL right now, I don't have to believe that. I can recognize that there's elements of Tyreek's, Tyreek Hill's game that are really sui generis. They're, they're not, yeah. they don't map onto any other player. They're in hard the to quantify right on that level. Right. Yeah. Or, or it's like one of the choices, and this is a controversial choice, and, and I could go really long into this, but one of the choices is they're modeling expected yards after the catch based on a player's speed at the time he receives the ball. So if you're going really, really fast, it says you're probably going to get a lot of yards after the catch. And then if you get a lot of yards after the catch, it says, well, you didn't outperform expectations. That's what I expect. But <laughs> right. possibly this makes sense. I don't know. There's there's some debate. I if tend you're to... Gabriel Davis running an over route and you're going as fast as you can and you're a big dude, then right. probably that's the case. But what about those guys who have that water bug acceleration like Tyreek Hill and Tank Dell? 
And and I think I don't really like adding like player specific factors into expectations when you're sure. trying to measure players because it it seems very counterproductive. But it's plausible to me that most NFL players operate in a relatively narrow band of speed. For the most part, like the difference between like a 90th percentile speed guy and like a 30th percentile percentile speed guy at wide receiver is probably not huge. Um, maybe this really is doing a good job of capturing that difference. But Tyreek Hill doesn't operate in that band. He's in a completely separate band. And I think it's completely fine to say like, look, this works for most people, but Tyre there's nothing like Tyree Kill in there. So our model, like you can't, there's no reference class to compare to. You can't say, oh, receivers like Tyreek Hill do this in this situation because there are no receivers yeah. like Tyreek Hill. He's, he's too fast, too much acceleration while still being able to separate. You, you mentioned Mike Wallace um, earlier today yeah. on Twitter and, and, and yeah, absolutely right. Like that people always said Mike Wallace, um, like he was better than his numbers because he creates so much gravity because he's so, he's so fast. Tyreek Hill is not Mike Wallace. Tyreek Hill, even if he were not the fastest player in the NFL right now, would still be a top 10 wide receiver. But then exactly. on top of that, you add the fact that he's the fastest player in the NFL. And, it, and it, it's a force multiplier. There's not anybody you can really compare him to. I'm not saying he's the best. I think Jefferson is probably a better receiver. Um, I might have Tyreek Hill as my number two, um, or I, I might prefer AJ Brown. Um, to me, those three, Stefan Diggs, Jamar Chase, you argue your top five. Maybe yep. you have a pet guy you want to fit in there too. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying you have to think that Tyreek Hill is the best, but I do think he's the most unique of, of the best receivers. Yeah, and I think that that's okay. They're all different flavors to a certain degree. And and I think your point about, you know, the the idea that, you know, the, some, some of these outliers aren't going to fit there. I mean, I just look at it this way. Way back in the day before um, talk radio and um, talk TV became what it is, I remember watching Private Parts, the, the, the story about the comedy about Howard Stern's career and how the, the radio station was when shocked that Howard Stern was doing so well at WNBC. And they were like, well, what they're reviewing the numbers and they're saying, well, the average listen time was a god awfully long period of time for those that loved him. Well, what about those who hated him? Because we're getting all this hate mail. Because they actually listen longer, you know, than the people who loved them. So they broke them and that confounded them because it broke the model for what they were expecting. And I think we have to understand the same thing with certain players is that when they break models and they're outliers, either A, they're the Bo Jackson, Barry Sanders, Tyree Kill, Jim Brown types where physically they're, you know, a generation or three ahead of most NFL players athletically. Um, or they're on a team with a certain and they have a certain skill set paired with a team that has an offense that leverages those skills in a way that th they haven't been leveraged before and defenses haven't caught up yet and may never catch up um, because it changes the entire system like the west coast offense once it started to really roll with you know the 49ers and what they were doing you know would have been a good example of that or the run and shoot for a short period of time or Ronnie Brown and Ricky Williams together in a backfield, you know, in Miami for that Wildcat offense for what a year and a half, you know. I mean, those what what we're seeing in Miami again with Mike McDaniel. I mean, those have to be good examples of that. And I think I think a lot of people's instinct when they see a model that that produces an unconventional result is this model is broken and we need to fix it because the model's wrong. But all models are wrong. Like you're not gonna, you're not building like... a refrigerator with models and going every time I'm going to get a perfect ice cube and the temperature is going to be this way. And if something changes, it's broken. Your your models right. aren't refrigerators, you know. Right. I mean, like I have, I don't, I don't do a whole lot of modeling just because I don't really have the patience or aptitude or skill for it. But um, I do have like my rookie receiver model that evaluates, you know, rookie years. Um, and I try to keep it as simple as possible. And one of the things about keeping it simple is it's obviously going to miss a lot of nuance. Um, but I think when you start adding all of that context and nuance, you risk overfitting. Um, and then it, it performs worse when predicting out into the future. And so my rookie receiver model last year, 
had Christian Watson having a better year than Garrett Wilson. Um, and a lot of people took issue with that. And I'm like, I get it. I, you know, I don't think that Christian Watson had a better year than Garrett Wilson. I get why he's rating higher here, you know, like his, his yards per route run and his touchdowns, touchdown adjusted yards per route run. Like these are on a level that we just don't see. Like he's kind of off the scale and me personally, I prefer the guy who's doing this consistently over a larger sample and is, is doing it in a way that looks a lot more sustainable and, and, um, more impressive to me. It, higher degree of difficulty executed at a more consistent level. But I don't feel the need to tweak my model to get Garrett Wilson back in front because that's just going to break something else somewhere else. I think the appropriate response to do there is, yes, the model has Christian Watson ahead of Garrett Wilson, but the model's not a death pact. I'm not like legally obligated to trade Wilson for Watson now. I can take this as a data point. I can incorporate it into my overall beliefs does this mean I prefer Watson to Wilson? No, of course not. I'd much rather have Wilson, but maybe I'm updating my opinion of Watson a little bit higher than it otherwise would have been. Maybe I'm coming down a little bit on Garrett Wilson because he really was, I mean, the Jets had pretty insane pass volume and that really did impact his production. You know, maybe the net result is, um, and, and this was the net result, maybe I'm leaning more Olave over Wilson. Instead, people love all-in-ones. They love, like, I just want... A, a, a simple answer where I can plug in the numbers and it's going to spit out an output and I can just accept that uncritically. And that's absolutely everything. And you can do that if you want, yeah. you know, like my model, if you're just using it as an all in one, it's going to perform pretty well, but it's always going to be better. If you just, if, if you're, if you're taking from a lot of different sources and you're saying like, this thing has strengths, this thing has weaknesses. Yeah. I'm going to consider the strengths. You know, I love, the open score for outside receivers on ESPN, I think has just an incredibly high degree of face validity. Um, I joke that it's basically like a near perfect match for Matt Harmon's reception perception work, uh, which probably drives him nuts because they're just like automatically getting that from player tracking data and he's spending, I don't know how yeah. many thousands of hours of years working, yeah. a year working on it. But to me like that, if, if an outside receiver has a really high open score, I'm sitting up and taking notice that like, this is probably measuring something real something like like the yards after catch score or the open score for slot receivers i don't think that really works i can compartmentalize and say like this is good this is bad you know i'm adjusting my opinion based on this i'm not adjusting my opinion or or i'm i'm not adjusting my opinion nearly as much based on this um and it's it's a lot messier and it's i i also get the appeal for just a single one size fits all um, cause it's, I don't, I'm lazy. I don't want to have to think things through and come to my own decisions. And then, you know, if I'm wrong, I don't want it to be because of me. I want it to be because of someone else too. But yeah. if the goal is to be right, th that's just the way you have to do it. You, it, you can't rely on single size solutions. Yeah. I mean, it's like rankings versus tiers. It's, you know, you're looking at those types of things, types of things that I do with the RSP. It's similar. It's like, there's players that... I know I have ranked two or three spots ahead of somebody else, but the the score is so close that I that I'm you know people can read my write ups who read my reps and go it sounds to me like you actually like this guy better than the guy that's ranked three spots ahead of him, and I'm like yeah I do you know but I want to be fair about how I came about it and transparent about how I did it so you know I like this guy more because I think he's going to be more consistent in the areas of NFL play that will probably bear out for him. Whereas this other guy's a little bit more of a high variance, um, prospect. Um, and you know, and for re you know, certain reasons why, but you know, that was fascinating the conversation. I know that we were going to talk a little bit about Dan Hendry and you and you know trained for future picks, but let's save that for next week. Um, I think that's probably a good conversation we can delve into a little bit deeper, but it would be fun to maybe talk about, you know, close this out with some players that we could, um, buy and sell, and then we can continue that conversation maybe into next week as well. But is there anybody that you're either buy, selling or holding in dynasty that really stands out to you? Um, you know, this, you know, at this point. Um, or would you prefer me to ask it in a way of saying, here's some players I'm buying, selling, and holding, and whether you agree or not? 
Yeah, I got some names. Um, first, I do want to start. I did read your article this week on players you're buying, selling, and holding. And I had to laugh a bit that like the Chad Kelly entry was, you know, if he were in the AFC West, he would be the second best quarterback, maybe even the best quarterback in the AFC West. He might be better than Patrick Mahomes. And then you rated him a hold. Like that to me seems like those are buy words right there. there I had him. I, well, it's funny because I originally had him as a buy. And it, I, I originally had him as a buy. And then I thought about it and said, well, yeah, but you're because he's essentially you're getting him for free he's essentially a hold because it doesn't take much. It doesn't cost anything. It doesn't I cost anything it. to buy him. So it. it made sense that I didn't want to be like, I didn't want to get somebody who may have misunderstood that and think, I've got to spend some money on this guy right away when it's like, nah, you can just talk to your commissioner and say, look, I'm I'm doing something crazy. I'm going to buy, um, I'm going to buy him, you know, for no, next to nothing. And then, um, you know, and and just tell my commissioner, can you give him, you know, Chad Henney as the place marker because he's probably not even his name's probably not even on Sleeper or my fantasy league anymore, um, or yes, definitely not ESPN or Yahoo. So you know, he's still on Flea Flicker. He is. Well, see, there you go. So I bet I I think Flea Flicker still has Barry Sanders on it. I love Flea Flicker. <laughs> I have to do a league. On I think Flea their rule Flicker. is if he's rostered in one league. He's still in the database. So if you were on Flea Flicker, they would definitely have him. But I don't know. I had this. I think he's probably still See, I've, I've had these ideas that haven't worked out very well in terms of execution. One of them was with um, one of them was with Mike McGregor, where we came up with a uh, well, he came up with that idea, actually, got to say. He came up with the idea of the Mike McGregor invented the first daily fantasy game but we just never got it to market on time. We were doing that together. We, we, but, uh, but he was the inventor of that. And then there was like, I wanted to do, you know, certainly we were all had thought about things like mock drafts, but I always thought it would have been fun to do a league where you could play current players and players from the past and somehow simulate it where you could have like, you could draft Jim Brown and you could, and Joe Green and like, and do something and somehow that it would sim something about the games would create a way to make it simulate but i couldn't really figure out a way where where that would where we could like make that work and keep it entertaining and not predictable you know in a fashion or problematic with the past players but anyway yeah i mean you know chad kelly certainly comes up as a to, to me i just look at it and i just as a browns fan i think well they're in they're in deep shit with their salary cap situation. Um, and we'll see whether Deshaun Watson can play his way out of, you know, the situation that he's in, in terms of dealing with injuries and questions about whether or not he, he really wants to, to play anymore and all that crazy stuff that you hear, um, which I'm not completely buying. I just think it's probably hard for him as it is to be playing right now with all the, the, the public condemnation that he's dealing with and maybe realizing now in his naivety that uh oh my life is going to be easy being a public face after what happened um you know people aren't just going to forget it you know so i think there's a little bit of that but also chad kelly's so cheap 1.185 million is what he's making as the highest played player in the cfl so yeah i mean i think Honestly, from what I studied in college of him, he has that he has that confidence of immediacy in terms of making decisions. Um, and what, people used to laugh about him, about his speed, and say, "Oh, he said he was the only player, the only quarterback faster than him was Lamar Jackson," and people were laughing about it because everything else that he did. But actually, that's quite true. Um, he actually would be the fastest quarterback in the NFL, other than Lamar Jackson based on um, what he ran in high school and what he did when he was healthy in college. Even when he wasn't healthy in college, there's displays I've seen with him coming off hernia surgery and an ACL tear that he would be faster than all, maybe about five quarterbacks, even in that state that he was in. So, yeah, I would I would love to see him in a, on a team like Cleveland that, would des that could desperately need another quarterback and move away from Watson and just let him sit on and rot on the roster if they need to. Um, and let things kind of calm down. But uh, yeah, he's someone I I'm I will be close to 
um, adding and coming to my commissioners and saying, I need a placeholder for Chad Kelly. Because I think in a year, in, no more than three years from now, he will be on an NFL team and getting a shot as a starter if he keeps playing the way he's playing. Yeah. Um, so we've talked before, a lot of my process is just age-adjusted redraft projections. Um, and I think looking at that, maybe the biggest buy in Dynasty right now for me would be Jacoby Myers on the Raiders. Um, and I get why people don't really like him. Um, you know, there's the punchline that he couldn't score touchdowns for the over the years. Although, like this year, he is way, 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 way over touchdown expectations, which just kind of goes to show that, you know, how random a lot of that is. Um, right now, there are seven wide receivers who are as young or younger than Jacoby Myers and projected for as many or more than Jacoby Myers, uh, according to Football Guy's most recent rest of year projections, uh, which, you know, like, Obviously, that doesn't mean I would have him eighth because Tyreek Hill is older than him, but I would obviously prefer Tyreek Hill to Jacoby Myers. Um, Chris Olave is projected for fewer points, but I would prefer Chris Olave to Jacoby Myers. But that kind of profile, where there's seven guys who are both younger and more productive, um, doesn't necessarily need to result in an eighth place ranking, but it should result in a ranking a heck of a lot higher than 50th which is where he currently is in the football guys and dynasty league football dynasty consensus should result in a ranking a heck of a lot higher than 40th, which is where he is on keep trade cut and fantasy calc, um, which are the two like community crowdsourced rankings. Um, and those tend to update a lot faster than, um, than the dynasty ranking consensus is because those are updating daily to new information. Whereas the rankings you have to wait rankers and they're updating every two or three weeks, like a certain percentage are going to be, relatively stale at any given time. Um, you look at a 26 year old wide receiver who graded pretty well, according to a lot of the film based processes heading into this year and was and was reasonably productive, lands on a new team and is producing like a top 15 wide receiver. Um, and, and in many respects, it's the Christian Kirk profile from last year, where again, Kirk was just rated way, 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 way too low because he, he had kind of become a punchline because of the contract and um, Kirk kept producing. Kirk is still producing to this day. If you added Christian Kirk at wide receiver 40 or wide receiver 50 prices, you made a huge profit and that there's really no end in sight on that. Um, and I think Jacoby Myers is the current Christian Kirk play. Um, I don't know exactly where I'd have him. He probably deserves to be around wide receiver 24 or 25, just based on that combination of fundamentals. Um, and, and given his stamp of approval from a lot of the film guys like Matt Harmon, who are watching it, uh, he's the one who jumps out far and away the most to me. Um, Puka Nakua, Matt Harmon did a, a podcast where he said, if, if Jackson Smith and Jigba was putting up Puka Nakua's production, where would he rank in dynasty? Probably wide receiver three behind Jefferson and Chase. Um, Puka Nakua does not rank wide receiver three, but but based on what he's put up so far and where he's projected to score the rest of the season, he's going to have like a sixth place finish at, um, what is he, 22 or 23 as a rookie? Uh, something like that should be like a slam dunk top 10 dynasty wide receiver. And I get the concern. I don't, you know, the draft capital is real. That fifth round thing means he he is a worse bet than if Jackson Smith and Jigba had used like this. Um, but I don't really see him being valued as a top 10 or top 12 dynasty wide receiver yet. Uh, and I'm kind of on in the place where I, I've seen enough. I think it's about time we have him there. I'd take, I'd take Puka Nakua over George Pickens. Oh, you know, oh, like I know, I know that, I, right? I know, but there are some people who, I mean, I to me, like when I said sell George Pickens, I thought there are some people. I wonder how people are going to react to that. But like, but to me, you know, Puka Nakua, you know, there are a lot of people still. There's that sentiment out in the film community when they see his athletic ability, and they're like, oh, George Pickens is going to be awesome. But they're they're still thinking in the Des Bryant mold, Equinemia St. Brown mold of like big tall receiver who can make plays at the boundary um and i i think pickens has upside to to realize 
but I don't think he's in an environment where that's going to be realized as efficiently as Puka Nakua already has. And so, yeah, for me, I would, I, I would sell, I would sell George Pickens for Puka Nakua in a heartbeat if I could get that. Um, and, oh, and I'd add. I mean, I would easily yeah, add. I would too. It's <laughs> funny too. It kind of illustrates like how much of dynasty is all about relative performance rather than absolute performance because Pickens, he was a hotly debated topic this last off season based on the underlying fundamentals, you know, draft position, rookie production. Um, you know, I think that people were a bit out over their skis on him. Like a lot of people were looking at him as wide receiver 20, 24, somewhere around there based on the fundamentals. I'd say more like in the 35 to 40 range for me. Um, and then he came in, to his tremendous credit, he's shown great improvement this year and he's been producing really well and he's kind of living up to the optimist's case. Um, like, you know, now I'm kind of coming around. I don't know if I'd still quite have him at 20 or 24, but I'm, I've, I've moved him up on my board because he, he performed a lot better than I expected. Um, but the problem is it, the optimists aren't saying, oh, we were right and keeping him where he was. The optimists are saying, oh, he's outperforming expectations and they're moving him up even higher. Yeah. Um, so again, it's that it's that relative movement where like Pickens is outperforming, Nakua is outperforming. So they're both moving up, but Pickens is starting from a higher point. So he's staying ahead in a lot of cases, um, despite, you know, I think that the, the nature of that performance um, being a lot less indicative of, of future production. Yeah, as a player, uh, as a player, I would put him in the mold of guys like Nico Collins, Michael Pittman. Um, I would even say if you're going to go with the smaller, quicker guys, Jordan Addison, T. Higgins, or Devonta Smith. Um, you, you know, I think that, the, you know, on the low end, I would be paying, you know, if I could get a Nico Collins or Michael Pittman for George Pickens, I would probably consider it. If I could get a Jordan Addison or T Higgins or Devonta Smith, I'd do that in a heartbeat. Um, even though those are guys that maybe not are performing as well as Pickens right now, they're guys that I, that I like their situation a little bit more um, long-term. Yeah. So I'm looking at fantasy calc, which, which calculates, player value based on actual trades and actual leagues. Um, so this is like what the trade market is right now. They have Pickens at 25, Pittman at 26, and Nico Collins at 28. Um, I agree with you. I'd take those two over Pickens. And it's it's close enough that that's, that's absolutely something you probably could get done right now. Um, they have Addison at 17, um, which speaking again of redraft, age adjusted redraft expectations, Football Guys has Addison, wide receiver 15 the rest of the way. And if you have a young, highly drafted player, um, there's pretty much no conceivable instance where he should be ranking higher in redraft than in Dynasty. That that just shouldn't be happening, um, barring like absolute massive outliers. And I get that part of that redraft at ranking is because um, Jefferson is missing some games, but he's not missing that many more games. Like a lot of that is just solid expectations for Addison, who's been playing really quite well. Um, yeah, I think it's, I, thinking about it, uh, I think it's an interesting question whether I would prefer Addison or Nakua right now among the rookies, um, because Nakua obviously has the benefit of the production to date and the expected production going forward. Addison has that safety net of that first round draft capital um, which means coaches just are less likely to do something dumb with them. Um, yeah. Move on to the next shiny thing. And, and it's an interesting question, and too, when you look at the two quarterbacks that they're playing with right now, both are old. Both are going to get, they're going to wind up playing before their contracts are up. Both are going to end up with a new quarterback, most likely. Um, so it's really, we don't know who the quarterback's going to be, whether it's going to be a veteran or a really good rookie or a really bad veteran or a really bad rookie. So either way, you, you've got a little bit, that's the risk there. But, you know, at the end of the day, then I, I think it, it comes down to however, what models you use to look at a player. Like for me, skill-wise, I like Jordan Addison as a, as a skill player better than I like Puka Nakua. But, um, but I like what Nakua has done I just think that there's a little bit more ways you could use Addison. And I think that gets back to to the, um, and I'm not saying Nikku has only been producing in the slot or anything, but yeah. but 
to the ESPN's open model and the replaceability of production. And I agree that, I mean, again, I, I, I don't mean at all to trivialize what Naku is doing because this is really without precedent. Yeah. Um, but I think the things that he's doing, it would be easier to find somebody who could do them yes. 70% as well than it would be to find somebody who could do what Jordan Addison is doing 70% as well. I would agree um, with that. And it's, it's hard too because you know, Justin Jefferson is there in Minnesota. He's not going anywhere. Um, Addison probably is not going anywhere for a while. We've seen, I think some people have a little bit of buyer's remorse on Jalen Waddell and Devontae Smith um, after they put up top 10 seasons as the as the Robin um, to, to a superior receivers Batman last year. Um, I, think we're all, I think we're always tracing, chasing last year's trends and I think that Addison's going to be a little bit underrated just because Smith and Waddle are disappointing a little bit, just like Smith and Waddle were probably a little underrated heading into the last year, just because we hadn't seen number twos put up top 12 fantasy seasons in a while. Um, yeah, I, I... And I think they're separate players that people get caught up in because they look at them in similar ways and they're looking at it and going, well, in Smith's case, Smith actually had limitations as a as a receiver in certain routes, whereas Waddle does not have those limitations nearly as much. But Waddle's now contending with a run game that's a bright and shiny new toy for Mike D uh, McDaniel. Um, whereas with Smith, he just got found out a little bit more. And I think that there's a difference there. Like for me, if you were going to separate those two, I'll be taking Waddle over Smith on the rebound, even though I still think Smith is going to do will eventually rebound. I think Waddle has a chance to return to top 10 numbers at some point. Um, whereas with Smith, I see him more as a 15 to 24 type of guy. Yeah. And I think as NFL players, Smith is probably better at the harder th the things where it's harder to find somebody who's good at them. Um, but Waddle is in a lot of ways like Tyreek Hill, where there's just not a lot of great comps for players who can do what he's doing. Yep. And you put him in... You know, if he were in on the New York Giants, I probably wouldn't be as excited about him. If he were on the Atlanta Falcons, I don't even know what Arthur Smith would be doing with him right now. I, putting yeah. him on run blocking every play, I don't know, and and still probably going five hundred. If he on were here. if he were on the Minnesota Vikings or the Detroit right. Lions, right, or the Philadelphia Eagles, yes. You know, if if you swapped, I d I don't know that the Eagles would trade Smith for Waddle. Um, you know, I say Waddle's kind of a unique player, but if you if you squint and tilt your head to the side, he's kind of doing a lot of the same stuff that AJ Brown is doing. Yeah. Um, not as comp. AJ Brown, I just said earlier, is my choice for the second best receiver in the NFL. Some days when I'm feeling a little pugnacious myself, I might put him number one over Jefferson. I, I just love the way he plays, just aesthetically. He's a great player. Um, and, and Waddle gives me a lot of, you know, he 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 kind of scratches the same itch in my brain. Um, so I really like Waddle. If he were on the Eagles, I could see being a little bit cooler on him. But the fact that he's with Mike McDaniel, like it's 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 kind of like you know the fun of buying a lottery ticket is fantasizing what what you would do if you'd win and that's waddle to me like imagine if mcdaniel like if teams just start selling out to tyreek hill and mcdaniel says like all right now let's see what we can do with with waddle to make them pay you yeah. know or if if hill um god forbid gets hurt or or eventually the contract becomes too onerous and, and they're forced to move on like kansas city was not a reflection on hill as a player but the cap is the cap um, and, and all of a sudden Waddle is the guy who's getting this McDaniel magic. Um, that would be really fun. And I, I think he could do some really cool and interesting things with Waddle that, you know, he couldn't really do with Devontae Smith. I don't know why I didn't say this, but now I'm having the fever dream, the same Chad Kelly to Brown's fever dream. I want, I want Jalen Waddle in Kansas City. Jalen Waddle with Patrick Mahomes. I, just forget the rest of these other receivers. It, you know, that would be an amazing thing because you would that would be as close to Tyreek Hill as you could get I, I really think that in terms of the 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 type of player that Waddle is so you know listen um this was fun we're gonna do more 
buy, sell, hold with of, of players next week. We're going to talk a little bit more about trading for future picks. Um, you know, talking about Adam's article and and you know, kind of piggybacking off of what Dan Hendry calculated in his fantastic dynasty work that he does over at FootballGuys.com, where you can find Adam with regression to the mean, or um, did I just call it regression to the mean? Um, but Adam, you know, you can find Adam's work with Dynasty in Theory. You can find, you know, all his regression articles. You can find the 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 rent a kicker articles which i think are always you know fun and helpful in a way of like you know that that's like that part you need at the hardware store you know where it's like you know it, it's a very specific thing that i think that is underrated because i even look at like industry leagues and i laugh at how like you can look at industry leagues and it's like week eight and you look at the rankings and it's like there's a big gap between the top three guys and like the twelfth, and they're all free agents. <laughs> and I'm sitting here going, <laughs> "What? You know what's going?" It's on? wild to me. Yeah. Jake Moody is still like not rostered in more than fifty percent of fantasy leagues, which I just like. Why? What are we even doing here? Like, it's it's kickers are super random, and and the edges aren't huge, but like you pay attention, and it's an extra half point, extra point per game, and. It, you know, maybe that's the difference. Look, I, I just, it. I just want to, I want a game this week against Dynasty League football that was by point zero three, so it matters. I, and that's a, you know, I've won championships by point one. Um, yeah. So usually it yeah. doesn't. I mean, it's it's yeah. really like you look at it; it's very rare for it to matter. Sure. But when it does matter, it matters a good deal. Yeah, without a doubt. So listen, we appreciate the fact that you think we matter enough to listen to our show. Um, and, you know, certainly you can check out all the shows that the RSP cast does um, on any of the, you know, formats that you download podcasts. You can also go to my site, mountwaldmanrsp.com, and I post everything there and you can listen to them right off the page. Um, and, uh, and if for some reason it's slow and it doesn't work, Look, it's not my problem. I'm telling you, I've already looked into this for some people. You've got to look up how to free up space on your phone, how to do different things that you need to do that doesn't stop playing. And I know it, my podcast may be the only one that it does that with, but I've I've checked I've checked out with my you know with the people that I have accounts with and have them troubleshoot, and they explain to me the same thing. So you, you know, there's lots of folks who aren't having an issue, but if you're one of those that did you may want to look into what you're doing. So <laughs> my um, favorite type of problem, other people's problems. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's a, it's it's not my problem, you know. I think you know, I can think of the guy from Dantzler at Mad Men who said it's not my problem though. It really was his problem. Anyway, thanks again folks. Have a good week.